Hey, happy Resurrection Day. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Hey, I want to just share with you a, a couple of things. One, you might have heard some talk about a, a thing called Mission 101. This is a, a four-week initiative that we have started just recently, and Mission 101 is, a, is an opportunity for you to uh, find out what New Hope is all about, to get connected, uh, find out what, what makes New Hope happen. It's, it's all about our core values and what we do and uh, how, we, how we operate here. And uh, so this is, this is like an introduction if you're fairly new to, to the church, or even if you've been around for 20 years and you go, well, I never had something like that. I want to see what what they're all about. So check it out. It happens during the Sunday school time at uh, 11 o'clock hour. It's a four-week thing, four-week session, and gives you a uh, really a great overview and helps you get started in how to connect and, and move on in uh, being involved and plugged in in the church. So that together for good video, I encourage you to stop by the table. There's a table right out here in the lobby. And then more information, I think it's an incredible ministry where we can reach out to families in our neighborhood and really make a difference, really make an impact, touching lives and touching families. I also want to let you know that Royal Family Kids Camp is an incredible ministry. And there is a table in the lobby uh, by the event center. And we have two different weeks of camp. One the first week of June, the first week of July. And they're ministering to children who come from uh, families, homes that are broken, where there's dysfunction, where there's abuse, and a lot of different things, just ministering to kids to try to share the love of Jesus, love them uh, in a week of camp. And there are some incredible testimonies of changed lives out of Royal Family Kids Camp. And so I encourage you, uh, spend a week Go to one of these camps. We've got people who are in leadership in both camps, and a lot of our people serve there. They need some help and some workers, and so I'd encourage you to check that table out and see how you might be able to be involved. And I want to let you know that next Sunday morning, we're going to be baptizing people in water in the morning service. So uh, if you've never been baptized and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to sign up, and we're going to have a great time uh, baptizing people next Sunday. Sunday in the morning. We oftentimes do that in the evening, so we're real excited about this. I want to take a moment to just welcome everyone who's joining us online today. Will you just give a hand for people who are joining online? And if you guys would just give a hand for everyone in the room, uh, we, we are so glad that you're able to join us. I just think back to two years ago, it was two years ago on Easter, this room was empty. Are you thankful that we can come in the room and be together? Amen. So thankful for what uh, God has brought us through, and I know that there's some challenges on our horizon. We live in a we live in a world that is getting stranger all the time, and I think that today the message that I'm going to share gives us hope as we move forward. That uh, no matter what the world looks like, no matter what's going on in the world, man, we have hope because Jesus. I thought that would be a bigger amen. Maybe I didn't say that right. <laughs> Great to be able to uh, bring this message to you today on this Resurrection Sunday, and uh, I just want to say, man, it's look good to look out, and I see a lot of faces that I haven't seen for a while, and uh, it, I, I, I hope that after today, you'll make every Sunday uh, part of your routine, and that you would be in church on Sunday. Join us, because we have a lot of fun. Today's probably a boring day compared to what we normally do, because it's, you know, I don't know why, because the announcements are boring. And I'm the boring preacher, so here we go. We'll do, we'll do our best to endure, and I'm going to get you out of here in enough time so that we can make the flip for the 11 o'clock service. But glad that you chose to be here today, and I hope that as you leave today, you are challenged. I hope today that as you leave, you're encouraged. I hope today that as you leave, you would say, uh, if, you, if you've known Jesus and had a relationship with him, that you leave going, mm, man, I'm charged up. And if you are coming today and you, you're feeling down, you're feeling lost, you're feeling hopeless, that today you leave feeling full of hope. You leave with a perspective that, you know what, I can do this life because Jesus has done it for me. And I'm so, so excited. The, the message this morning is the greatest miracle. I want to talk about miracles today because I believe that on this day, the resurrection day, the day, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, probably the greatest miracle that's ever occurred. 
the greatest miracle that's ever occurred, and, I, and I'm going to spell it out for you today, and I, and I think you'll, you'll, uh, you'll agree with me if you don't already. But as you read through the Bible, the Bible is filled with all kinds of miracles. From the very beginning, we see God creating the world by speaking it into existence. The third verse in in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 says, God said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. That's incredible. That's miraculous. And you can read on from there, and he spoke, and boom, it was. Thought, thought that would have a better reaction than that. <laughs> I'm the boring pastor, though, so this is, this is how it works. There are so many examples of, of, of miracles just in the Old Testament that I can think of. The Israelites being set free from slavery in Egypt. There was 10 plagues, awful, horrendous plagues that came. And finally, the Egyptians told the Israelites, who were their slaves, get out of here. Leave us. Leave us alone. It's because of you why this is happening. And then when they, when they all exited out of Egypt and they realized, hey, we just lost all of our labor force. They went chasing after them. And literally the Israelites got the, between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. And all of a sudden I'm thinking in their mind they're going, God, you brought us out here just to trap us. And we're going to perish right here. But what did God do? Part the waters of the sea. And the Israelites walked across the sea on dry ground. Amazing. And as the Egyptians were following after them, Israelites got out of, the, out of the sea and the waters came and drowned the Egyptian army. Incredible, miraculous story. You can't, you can't make stuff up like this. I, as I read manna being provided when they were wandering in the wilderness, food just showed up every day. Again, the waters of the Jordan River just supernaturally part and they were able to walk into the promised land on dry ground. The massive walls of Jericho. God said, walk around the city every day. They walked around the city. On the seventh day, six days they walked around once. On the seventh day, they walked around seven times. And as they walked around the seventh time, the massive walls of Jericho just began to crumble. You can't, you can't plan something like that. God does miracles. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace and were saved. Not a hair on their head was singed. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothes. Daniel spent the night in a den with lions. And he was unharmed. Those little kittens might have licked him, but they didn't chew on him, and he survived. Jonah was swallowed by a big fish, trying to run from God. Three days he spent in the belly of that fish until that fish vomited him up, on, and he finally did what God told him to do. But miracle after miracle after miracle in the Bible. Dictionary.com defines a miracle as this, an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause, considered a work of God. That's a miracle by the dictionary definition. Eugene Peterson said this, when, someone, when something happens that we can't explain, we say that it's a miracle. But under that definition, most things that a magician does would be a miracle to me. And I know good and well that it's not a miracle. A miracle by biblical tradition, he says, is not just what we don't understand, but what is done for us that we can't do for ourselves. Or what is done, what God does for us through someone else that we can't do for ourselves. This is uh, Psalm 77, 14 says, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. So Easter just isn't a time for us to dress up in, in fancy clothes and, and show up at church and maybe eat some chocolate bunnies. <laughs> Anybody ever figure out where we got chickens and bunnies? It has nothing to do with the resurrection, but we can make it kind of fit. We have to jump through some hoops. But it's not just about that. I'm going to get my share of chocolate, believe me. I have not eaten a lot of chocolate yet. Some of you don't know, but I love chocolate. I love chocolate. <laughs> love, love, love chocolate. And I, 
And I, uh, I was on a diet a few months ago, a couple months ago, and lost a lot of weight, and uh, I didn't eat any chocolate. But that's not the reason why I lost weight. I'm gonna try to not lose weight anymore, and I'm gonna try not to gain weight anymore, all while eating chocolate. So this day might be about, about candy and chocolate and dressing up and going to church, but this day really is a time for us to reflect on the most miraculous thing ever to happen. Jesus entered the world and literally changed everything. So today I want to talk about miracles. And the first thing that I want to talk about is miracle, miracles of Jesus. And you can see it says miracle of Jesus, miracles of Jesus. So I want to talk about Jesus himself. Jesus was a miracle. His birth, his life, his death was a fulfillment of over 300 prophetic words in the Old Testament. So his birth, you go back to the Old Testament, it predicted or prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem, born to a virgin, in the lineage of David, in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would be called Emmanuel. And all of those things happened, and everything that was said about him was fulfilled in this one person. He's literally a miracle. In his death, the Old Testament says he would be betrayed. He would be falsely accused. He would be crucified. It says that his hands and his feet would be pierced. They didn't even understand what that meant. Crucifixion wasn't even a thing. He would, he would be given vinegar to drink, gamble for his garments, and his side would be pierced with a sword. Listen, all of that happened. Jesus himself is a miracle. He's the fulfillment of all the prophecies. Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus took the 12 disciples aside, and they were getting ready to go into Jerusalem for the, for the end event when he would be crucified. And this is what he said to his 12 disciples. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. And he gives a few of them. He said, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. He said all of that about himself before he went into Jerusalem. He told his disciples what was going to happen. Listen, it's one thing to tell somebody that you're going to die. But it's another thing altogether to say that I'm going to rise from the dead. We can do, any of us could stage our own death. But how do you stage you coming back to life again? That's a miracle. The Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' earthly ministry begins with the Sermon on the Mount. And throughout the sermon, Jesus spoke with great authority. He spoke with great knowledge. And he demonstrated his authority through a, a plethora of miracles that he performed. His compassion for people was undeniable as he healed the sick, paralyzed, the blind, and the suffering. Even the wind and the waves obeyed what he said. He spoke and calmed the storm. The New Testament is filled with examples of, of Jesus exercising his authority over not only diseases, but demons and nature, over sin and over death. He performed miracle upon miracle. And all of the miracles that were performed by Jesus were in a tangible way, a, a, a tangible way for people to see that he was who he said he was, that he was Messiah, that he was the Son of God who came to save the world. So that sermon happens in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the very next thing, when that sermon is over with, we see Jesus perform a miracle after miracle after miracle. Look in Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9. This is what we see in those following chapters. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. He heals the Roman centurion's servant. He heals Peter's mother-in-law and a whole bunch of people in that, in that same event. He calms a raging storm by rebuking the wind and the waves. He casts demons out of two men, and those demons go into a herd of pigs, and they jump over a cliff and drown in the water. He heals a paralyzed man. He heals a woman who had been bleeding, had a bleeding issue for 12 years. He raises the synagogue leader's daughter from the dead. He heals two blind men by restoring their sight, and he heals a mute person by casting out a demon. You can look in the book of John. Seven miracles are recorded in the book of John. He turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana. He heals a government official's son who was deathly sick. He heals a paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. He feeds 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves. And there were 12 baskets full of leftovers when he was done. He walks on the water in a storm. He heals a man who's been blind since birth. 
And he raises Lazarus from the dead after he'd been in a tomb for four days. Look at the end of John chapter 20, verse 30, and it says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. So we've recorded some of them here, but then he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Why does Jesus do miracles? Why did he perform miracles in the Bible? So that we would know who he is. So we would know that he is the Son of God, that he is Messiah, and that by believing in him, we would have life. We benefit from this. Listen, I don't know what it is that you're facing today, but we're all candidates for miracles. We're all candidates for healing. Let me just give you just a sample list of what God can do or conditions or syndromes or sicknesses that he can maybe heal. Asthma. Anybody with asthma? Influenza, emphysema, myeloma, lymphoma, pneumonia, melanoma, arthritis, diverticulitis, bronchitis, phlebitis, sinusitis, meningitis, appendicitis, encephalitis, hepatitis, (sighs) multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis, endometriosis, tuberculosis, mumps, measles, chickenpox, smallpox, deafness, blindness, scarlet fever, yellow fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, diabetes, epilepsy, cancers of all kinds, and COVID. All we've done is scratch the surface of what God can do to bring healing into a person's life. We are are an example. We are an opportunity for God to work his miracles in us. This is an incredibly short list of diseases that can afflict us. Some of them are just a nuisance. Some are very painful. Some are debilitating, and some are actually fatal. But whether it's a, a disease or a disorder, a sickness or a syndrome that you're facing or battling, Or it's something to do with your family, your marriage, your job, your finances, your friendships, alcoholism, drug addiction, addictions of any kind, whether it be pornography or gambling or food or the internet. Listen to what the scripture says, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. God is able to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think through his power that is at work in us. So no matter what it is that you're battling, no matter what it is that you're facing today, a sickness or some kind of an addiction or whatever it might be, the power of God can help you to do infinitely more than you ever can even think or ask in your wildest imagination. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. I want you to listen to this. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that made him dead and buried in a tomb for three days, come back to life, lives in you as a follower believer of Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus did. Oh, let me finish that verse. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. That's powerful. Everything that Jesus did, the words that he spoke, the miracles that he performed, his sinless actions, proved that he was the Messiah, the Son of God who had come to save us. Listen, when God intervenes in your life, providing unexpected money or resources, he doesn't do that just to keep your bank account from being overdrafted. When the doctors can't explain where the cancer went, God's not just interested in doing that for your own comfort. When the phone rings with offers of help after you've cried out to God, that isn't a coincidence. These things happen, the Bible says, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus is a miracle. He, his life is a miracle, and he does miracles. And the same power that, that does that in him lives in you. I want to talk about the miracle of resurrection. This is the day that we celebrate resurrection. I want to read for you a passage of scripture from John chapter 20. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or you can read the big Bible on the screen. This is John chapter 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away 
from the entrance. And this is interesting what she does. She shows up at the tomb. It's dark. It's early on that Sunday morning. She sees that the stone has been rolled away. And verse 2 says, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Who is the other disciple? John. John's the one writing this, and he talks about himself as the other disciple. But notice how he also qualifies, qualifies himself, the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> so Peter and that other disciple, moi, the one Jesus loves. So, but it's interesting that Mary shows up at the tomb and sees that the, the stone is rolled away from the tomb. And rather than doing anything else about it, she goes back and finds Peter and John. And she says, this is what she says. They've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Who's we? It was just her by herself. She's come to this conclusion. She sees the stone roll. Somebody stole Jesus. So she goes and finds Peter and that other disciple the one Jesus loved, and she tells them someone has stolen Jesus. Well, see what happens next. Peter and the other disciple, they started out for the tomb. They were both running. And listen to what he says. But the other disciple outran Peter. I mean, he's telling a story about the resurrection of Jesus, and he has to make the point that we were running to the tomb, and I outran Peter. But he doesn't say it like that. The other disciple, he was much faster. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he stooped and looked and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first... Got to get my plug in there. I, yeah, remember? I, then, the, then me, the disciple that got there first, but that didn't go in. I finally went in, and I looked. And the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Listen, Jesus had been telling them over and over. He said, listen, we're going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. It's going to be horrible. They're going to bury me in a tomb, but three days later, I'm going to rise. He told him that multiple times. And it says right here that John, the one who wrote this gospel, didn't even believe. Like when he walked into the tomb and saw that the body was gone and he saw the clothes, he, all of a sudden it was like, he told us this was going to happen. And it says that he saw and believed. And the scripture says that Peter and John went home. But Mary was still standing outside the tomb crying, and she wept, and she stooped and looked in. And she saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. He says the same thing. Dear woman, why, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go and get him. All this stuff in her mind is somebody sold Jesus. Just tell me where he's at so I can go get him back. And I don't quite know how this was stated, but the scripture says, Jesus said to her, Mary. And I don't know if it was, hey, Mary, or Mary. But whatever happened, he said the name Mary, and it's like all of a sudden she realized it's Jesus. The one who she assumed had been stolen, actually standing there in front of her, the one she thought was the gardener, is the one that she's talking to. It's Jesus, and he's alive. He is alive. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. It says that they went and told the other disciples and gave them this message. I want you to imagine with me. We, we, we hear the story of the resurrection. We know what happened there and uh, with all the details. But I want you to imagine with me if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. What if there was no resurrection? Paul kind of speculates on this if you uh, take time to read 1 Corinthians 15 today. It's all about resurrection. It's all about the resurrection. But he speculates in 1 Corinthians 15, what if there was no resurrection? 
This is what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then all of our preaching is youth, useless and your faith is useless. He's saying, look, this whole exercise of what we're doing here today, where we gather together like this, I've wasted my time putting words on a page to be able to deliver to you. That was useless. You getting your nice clothes on and coming out on a, on a Sunday morning to church, if Christ hadn't risen from the dead, this is all pointless. If Christ hadn't risen from the dead, this wouldn't be worth anything. <clears throat> he goes on to say our preaching of the gospel would be pointless. It's powerless. Without the resurrection, there's no good news. It's only bad news. It would be an empty, useless, hopeless message of meaningless nothing. Our faith in Christ would be futile, it would be fruitless, it would have no purpose. Our witness for God would be wasted, it would be worthless. All people, every one of us, would be stuck in our sin and we die, we perish. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then sin won the victory over him. And the wages of sin is death would be the final word. Our death would be permanent. Our funerals would be final. When we die, we die, that's it. We're permanently, eternally in the grave. Our sins unforgiven, our faith in vain, dead forever without God and without hope. Isn't that a great message to come here today? If Christ hadn't been risen, we just have to speculate and wonder what that would be like. If Jesus never rose from the dead, not only can he not help us in the, in the life to come, but he can't help us right now. If he can't give us eternal life, then he can't help improve our earthly life. And Christianity is nothing more than a charade, a farce, an absolutely and utterly tragic joke. But, that's the word that Paul uses. It's, it's the word but. It's a, conjun a, a conjunction. It joins a couple thoughts together. He's conjecturing about what it would be like if Christ hadn't raised from the dead. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he starts that sentence with the word but. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead. He's no longer in the grave. He's risen, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. The empty tomb testifies that our Savior lives. Mary Magdalene saw it. Peter saw it. John, the one that Jesus loved the most, he saw it. And the scripture says that literally hundreds of people witnessed an alive Jesus after he had been buried and after he'd been crucified and buried in a tomb. They saw him alive. They witnessed his resurrection, his appearing there. Because Jesus was raised from the dead and because Jesus does live, the Bible says we too shall live. And our preaching isn't pointless. Our preaching is powerful. That's what I'm hoping today, that we can capture and grab hold of this message that is powerful to change lives, to give hope, to give purpose and meaning. Life without Jesus is meaningless. Don't do life without Jesus. Our faith isn't futile, it's functional. Our witness isn't wasted, it's, it's worthwhile. We're not stuck in our sin. Our sin is settled. Jesus paid the price with his blood on the cross, and we are forgiven. Our funerals are not final, and we're not the most pitiful, miserable people on the planet. Because Jesus has risen, and we have new life. Old things are passed away. Everything has become new. We have new hope. We have the hope of nations, the promise of eternal salvation, grace that is greater than all of our sin, unconditional, never-ending love, mercies that are new every morning, and peace that passes all understanding. Are you thankful for that today? We have life, we have hope, we have help, we have salvation because Jesus is alive. Of all the miracles recorded in the Bible, the greatest has to be the resurrection of Jesus. We don't serve a dead God who's in the grave. We serve a God who is risen and alive. Let me read this verse for you again, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. How did Jesus come alive again? God raised him from the dead. He lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the, from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living in you. Not only can we celebrate the resurrection, we can experience it. 
You're a candidate for God to do something amazingly miraculous in your life. There's something even greater than experiencing miracles and miraculous healing here on this earth. And you're going, what in the world would that be? Luke chapter 10, Luke records that Jesus sent out 72 disciples. He had 12 close disciples and he had more disciples. But Luke 10 records that he sent out 72 disciples in pairs. He sent them to the towns and to the places where he was planning to visit in his ministry here on earth. And he gave them instructions and he sent them out. And he said, this is what I want you to go do. You go and do ministry in these towns. And if, if, if they accept you, somebody will be there and they'll open their home and let you stay with them. If you're not welcomed in that town, shake the dust off your shoes and go to the next town. Don't waste your time there. There are people that need to be ministered to. And verse 17 says that when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Your name is powerful. Jesus is going, hello? Have you not seen what I've been doing? It's like they were surprised, like, wow, Jesus, you're somebody. You're something. Jesus is saying, haven't you been paying attention? All authority has been given to me. Jesus goes on to say, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And in verse 20, he says this, put it in perspective. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Yeah, I've given you the authority. I've given you the power. But don't, don't make a big deal about that. Don't rejoice about that. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. That's what's most important. <laughs> Boring pastor. I'll get it, I'll get it in some, well, one way or another. There's so much more to life than what we experience here on earth day to day. As followers of Jesus who believe in him and put our trust in him, we live with the eternal hope of heaven. He said, rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Listen, this world, the craziness of things that are going on in this world, I don't understand. I don't get it. There's a bunch of weird, crazy stuff going on. Except that the book talks about what is going to happen at the end of time. And it says that there's a promise with that, that Jesus is coming back. And I think we need to be looking for him, and I think we need to have our eyes on heaven. I don't know if you've ever noticed or realized that uh, a lot of what we do in life is avoiding death. Think about this. Virtually everything in our life relates somehow to death. We have life insurance. It's actually death insurance. We have life insurance so that if I don't live, my family can have some money and be able to provide. We have life insurance. We have hospitals, doctors, medicine, speed limits on the highway, seat belts in our cars. Why? Because we know that death is a reality. We do what we can to protect ourselves, to keep ourselves safe, to keep ourselves alive. We don't want to die. That's all good, but listen, too many people are way too afraid these days. We cannot be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, don't, don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Don't fear the government. Don't fear the stuff in the world. Put your hope, your fear, fear God. Trust him. Jesus said this to his disciples. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Listen to what Jesus said. I'm going to heaven to prepare a place for you. My father's house is a big house. I watched or I heard a report this week of the new quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Bought the, uh, we got Broncos fans in the house. He bought the, that's weird. Hey, um, he bought the most expensive house in the Denver area, $25 million, over 20,000 square foot of space, four bedrooms, 12 bathrooms. 
I don't get it. I got five bedrooms in my house. It's like 2,000 square feet. We sleep in closets. But as, as much as you can imagine, you know, this mansion of a home, it pales in comparison to what Jesus is providing for us. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. What he offers is, is, is not just a better now, but a better place. Jesus calls heaven my father's house. Listen, we don't know everything there is to know about heaven, but what the Bible tells us, it sounds amazing. Revelation, the end of the book, says there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. This is what I think heaven is like. What it looks like. No crime or violence, no courts or jails because there's no criminals. No greedy politicians. No drug dealers, child molesters, or sex traffickers. No more wars or bombs or terrorists or dictators. In heaven, there's no tears, no sorrow, no crying or pain, no regrets and no remorse. No more lying, deception, gossip, envy, jealousy, selfishness, or anger. There's no bitterness, no failure, no sorrow, nor suffering. Listen, Paul puts it in context. He says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal in us later. It'll be worth it all when we get to heaven, when we see Jesus. No eyeglasses. No braces, wheelchairs, or crutches. No false teeth. Uh, I still have a few of mine. Or hearing aids. No more hospitals, nursing homes, because no one grows old and no one gets sick. No more accidents, heart attacks, or strokes. No more cancer. There are no more cemeteries and no funerals for no one will die. We live forever. This is heaven. Heaven is a real place and I'm going there. How many of you want to go with me? It's Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You could go to the swankiest resort, visit the most expensive homes, the hotels. It won't even come close. Jesus didn't tell his disciples that he would be resurrected. I mean, he did tell them that, but that wasn't all that he was saying. Not just that I would be resurrected. This is what he said, John eleven twenty five: I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever believes in me will never die. Listen, if we put our hope and our trust, our life in Jesus, we don't die. I stop breathing here on this earth, I start breathing in heaven. I stop seeing here on this earth, I start seeing in heaven. I'm gone here, I'm there. I love that. That's why I don't worry. I wear my seatbelt because my family tells me I should. And because that little beeping sound just gets annoying. I'm not on a death wish, but I want to go to heaven someday. This is what God has testified, John 5, 11, 1 John 5, 11. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Listen, life comes through Jesus. He says, I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. How many of you want to know that you have eternal life? You can know today. But listen, just as sure as there is a heaven to be gained by believing and putting your trust in Jesus, there is a real hell for those who disobey and choose not to follow God's plan. That's a reality. I've heard it said like this. Hell isn't a place that God sends people that he's mad at. Hell's just a place that people can pay for their own sins if they want to. Let me say that again. Hell isn't a place that God sends people that he's mad at. Hell is a place where people can go who choose to pay the price for their sins if they want to do that. Let me, let me tell, tell you this. If you believe in Jesus, earth is as close to hell as you're ever going to get. And it only gets better. If you put your trust, if you believe in Jesus, earth is as close to hell as you're going to get. And it only gets better. But I got to tell you the other perspective. The opposite is true too. It's important that you hear this. If you haven't believed in Jesus yet, earth is as close to heaven as you're going to get. And it only gets worse from here. Does that make sense? 
Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I've talked a long time. But I believe that right now you know if you're with Jesus or not, if you're right with Jesus. And while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, here's what I can offer you. I can offer you Jesus, eternal life through Jesus because of what he did. And if you're here today and you've not made that decision, you're not living for Jesus, and today you want to know that you have life, it's as simple as saying to him, Jesus, forgive me. I believe that you are who you said you are. All those things that were said about you in the Old Testament, you were that. All the things that you've done and that you're still doing, you're the Son of God. And I believe in you. And I need you to forgive me. How many of you would just raise your hand today? I'm gonna look, I want you to hold your hand up and look at me. If you're saying, I, I'm choosing Jesus today. I'm not in relationship with him. And today I'm choosing him because I want life. I want heaven. I want, I want his presence now. Just looking across the room, Jesus, raise your hand and keep it raised. I'm looking to my right, your left. Thank you. Keep your hand up. Anybody else? If you're joining us online today, and that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with people in the room here who are doing the same thing. It's just a simple prayer that says this, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you're Messiah. You're the Savior. You came to this earth, you lived here on this earth, and you willingly gave your life, even though you never sinned, to die in my place. Thank you for loving me that much. Forgive me of my sins change my heart, change my life. Let me live with the hope of heaven someday with you and to live with the assuredness of your presence with me and living in me to help me to overcome. Thank you, Jesus. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join with me in just welcoming those people who have made that decision? to stand. We're going to end with the song today. And here's what I want to do before we sing that song. Because we've been talking about miracles. And let me say this. I, I, I really believe whether you raised your hand or not, God is speaking to your heart. And it don't have to be, it doesn't have to be in church that you say yes to Jesus. But you say yes to Jesus before it's too late. Because there will come a time where it's too late. There will come a time when you've crossed over and there's just no, no more opportunity. Because our life is fragile. Dan, you came to a near-death experience just a couple years ago. And you're here today. But if you hadn't known Jesus, it would be a different, a different scenario complete. I'm so glad that you're here today, Dan. Listen, miracles. Samuel is back here. Samuel had surgery a couple weeks ago. How old is Samuel? Seven months. He had major brain surgery. His left side didn't work. And uh, they did a swallow study at the after surgery on Wednesday, and they got cut loose and sent home from, from the hospital on Wednesday. And he's doing fantastic. No seizures? No seizures since. Praise God. He was having multiple seizures a day. That's what God can do. Whether he uses a doctor, medicine, or he just does it miraculously. How many of you today need, need a miracle in your life? Maybe there's uh, some kind of a disease, some kind of a, of a situation, a syndrome. Maybe, maybe it's a situation in your family. I don't know what it is, but you need Jesus to intervene. Would you just raise your hand today, and as we sing this song, I want you to believe that God is going to answer your prayer. And listen, he may not answer it in the next hour, but, but you can trust him. Wherever you go, you leave today, you don't leave him here. He goes with you, remember? He lives in you. If you belong to him, he goes with you everywhere you go. Let Jesus live full in you. Let Jesus live strong in you. Live an overcoming life. Listen, we need this. We need to encourage one another. Don't make it a point to not be in church. Make it a point to be here. It's not about church attendance, but somebody here needs you. 
There's somebody that you can make a difference in their life and someone that you need to make a difference in their life. We need one another. This is the church. We need to encourage each other all the more as we see the day approaching when Jesus is going to return. Let's encourage one another. And now let's get out of here because we got another service coming in like 16 minutes. So don't dilly-dally. Take Jesus and go home. Go to lunch. Bless you guys.